Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our discussions of the feature films directed by that signature artist extraordinaire, this one-of-a-kind premier uh, cinema artist talent and genius filmmaker who is the one, the only, Mr. Brian De Palma. As some of you may know, we have been going through each of the feature films directed by Mr. De Palma in chronological order uh, with respect to his body of work, his filmography, his feature film filmography. That brings us today to a discussion with respect to his film released in 1978, and there is much to say, much to say about this incredibly memorable and oh so Brian De Palma esque film, with a few touches along the way that I think are very, very worth discussing. This is the 1978 film that is The Fury. So, as we've been doing for the past discussions, let me first focus on a non spoiler, very general generally worded discussion first, again for the benefit of those who have not yet seen this film, The Fury. Then afterwards, I will enter into a more plot-specific or spoiler-specific discussion, again in the latter half of this, of this video discussion or this talk, uh, you and I, uh, about this film, The Fury. But So let us first speak of this film in very general, non-spoiler territory, again for the benefit of those who have not yet seen this work, The Fury. So we can start with the wonderful cast. Uh, for example, we have people like Kirk Douglas and Carrie Snodgrass and Amy Irving and Charles Durning and Fiona Lewis and Andrew Stevens and John Cassavetes and others. And this is a brilliant cast and each uh, has a wonderful, compelling way to portray uh, their respective characters. And believe me, this is a film that has a lot of subplots, a lot of characters that are converging and diverging across its entire landscape of action, adventure, and suspense, and a lot of intense and quite uh, almost horrific or violent scenes that are punctuating the entire process or, or uh, procedures that we can say make up this intricate plot or the plot details of the film. So there are many characters involved and again each character is portrayed with a lot of, of uh, energy and gusto and a lot of uh, will uh, portrayed uh, for each of their subplots or their character arcs and they, they kind of combine in this uh, vivid way uh, throughout the landscape of this Brian De Palma film. And then also we have, in terms of the production values, we have, of course, Brian De Palma being the director, and then we have uh, John Ferris. Uh, the story is based upon the writings of John Ferris, and then he's also credited as well in terms of the contribution to the story for the cinematic adaptation. And then we have to uh, Richard H. Klein in terms of the cinematography, Paul Hirsch in terms of the editing, and we have uh, Frank La Yablin's uh, producer, and John Williams uh, providing the musical score, and another very, uh, very interesting, a memorable turn in terms of the overall, say, mood or atmospherics of this work, The Fury. Now, I mentioned the word, uh, the words mood or atmospherics, and I think those words go hand in hand with, say, the suspense or tension-filled drama or cinematic uh, cinematic experiences of a Brian De Palma film. And The Fury is indeed no exception to that. I mean, this is an exemplary, uh, very action-packed Brian De Palma film. I think if we were to try to focus, say, on a general expression of the plot, we have a number of elements going on. We have uh, this uh, element introduced fairly early on about psychic powers and about certain individuals that we meet throughout the course of the opening of the plot that seem to, or we are uh, suggested by various tricks and various styles of cinema, both direct and indirect, we are introduced to certain characters who we understand have special abilities, have psychic powers, have this means by which they can use their thoughts or their mind to 
control things or manipulate objects or perhaps grow uh, their intense uh, powers more and more. And so we have this conceit. And embedded in this conceit, we have a number of trains or a number of avenues running through this. So, for example, we have uh, certain other individuals who are trying for reasons of their own. And again, we find this out during the course of the film. We find other individuals, other characters trying to find or apprehend or come into contact or exploit, whatever the case may be, these people. Uh, who have special powers. So we have the people who have special powers on the one hand, and then we have the uh, other people, other characters that are trying for their own reasons to find them and to meet them. And along the way, we have a number of relationship dynamics that are set up, both in terms of the intimate and personal and emotional, uh, both in terms of parents and children, the generational connections or gaps or drift or or uh, say the divide as the case may be and so there we have uh, sources of say romantic uh, connection and drama as well as suspension suspense and tension because where there is unity there's also conflict and when there is conflict there is a lot of conflict in the hands of Brian De Palma and so we have that in the context of say uh, parents and children uh, intimate emotional relationships and the like which adds to the human drama which also provides the opportunity for us the viewer hopefully uh, potentially maybe and yes ideally to be able to access the world of the fury as we are watching it unfold before our very eyes and ears so that's one thing and then the other aspect of the pursuit is the government or some other kind of authoritarian or quote-unquote sinister force at work or at play that may be trying to apprehend and exploit these powerful figures for some kind of uh, research or some kind of uh, maybe medical or perhaps military reasons. Who knows? There is a type of sinister undercurrent at work uh, in terms of, of the external forces trying to apprehend uh, these key central figures with psychic powers. So that also forms another source of the tension. And sometimes we have characters that then create yet their own levels of tension as well along the way because uh, where we have a sort of pursuit and uh, uh, a contest or a type of, of uh, a race to the finish line. Who will be able, which force will be able to find these powerful uh uh, powerful figures first? Or will it be, quote-unquote, uh, the heroes, or will it be, quote-unquote, the villains? And again, that's, again, part of the the uh, fun and energy and excitement and suspense that is the Brian De Palma film, The Fury. And then also added into that a type of psychological uh, landscape as well, because in this tableau of psychic powers and seemingly sinister or villainous authoritarian forces at work, as well as parents and children and other types of emotional and intimate relationships uh, that drive people to try to find uh, these uh, special gifted uh, individuals. We also have the psychological landscape, this idea too of trauma, this idea of stress, this idea of abandonment and loneliness and guilt that also lead to very dire and significant consequences uh, in terms of what the characters, uh, what this film has in store for these characters as they reach the beginning, middle, and end of this work. So uh, there's also this type of psychological tableau at work, as well as the use of, say, the psychic power conceit or element of this film. Now, this is where we have uh, the film going into what one might say uh, hyperdrive or a type of uh, over a very, very intense uh, bursts of, of uh, cinematic and indeed quite violent or uh, violent uh, energetic uh, scenes. So this is a film that is in bursts uh, quite intense indeed, again using the psychic powers uh, conceit and motivation. And there are scenes that have a, a great deal of intensity. There are some bursts that are quite burstful indeed. And there are moments of shock and awe 
that also punctuate uh, this film that also has within it levels of emotional and intimate intensity as well as examinations uh, from a character level of psychological portraits as well as the race to the finish line between quote-unquote the heroes and quote-unquote the villains uh, along the way as well as being an action-packed film. There are moments of of, uh, action and uh, chases and and uh, and the like, as well as uh, sort of final showdowns and the like. So there is a lot of action set piece, as well as the intimate and personal, as well as the psychological, as well as the bursts of intense special effects violence along the way. Again, a la Brian De Palma in uh, the best sense of that phrase. So uh, this is, I think, in a nutshell, what one can expect when one is watching The Fury for the first time. I would uh, uh, very much uh, suggest, again, Uh, If, say, this type of intense uh, science fiction slash horror film genre is not for you, or if violent uh, scenes, uh, intense special effects violent scenes are not for you, that for not, or if they are not for you, then perhaps uh, this film might not be your cup of tea, Uh, and so that's okay. Uh, But if that type of film experience is okay with you. And if you have not yet seen The Fury, and in addition, if you have seen other works by Brian De Palma and you have enjoyed them, like, say, Sisters or Carrie or Obsession, or maybe some of the other works that we will talk about in future discussions in this series about Brian De Palma films, then if you have enjoyed those films, then I can strongly, strongly, strongly suggest watching The Fury. It is a knockout of a film. I think there are many links that can be said to maybe possibly exist with other works by Brian De Palma. And personally, I I might uh, agree with such assessments, although maybe with in other respects, I might have my own direction as to how I interpret this film, The Fury. Again, in the context of the Brian De Palma filmography, there have been connections made perhaps with, say, films like Carrie in terms of the psychic powers element, or maybe there are um, uh, aspects of the film uh, uh, maybe uh, as a type of, of uh, um, as a type of, say, uh, a spiritual sequel in that way. And I, for one, maybe look at the film in some regards agreeing with such assessment, but also in other, regard, other regards maybe not necessarily going along with that assessment 100%. But that is also my way to then uh, inject my own view, which is to say that The Fury is its own work. It stands on its own legs, I think very confidently so. And it does so in a way that is uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, very much wanting to entertain. It's it's so evident uh, and so wonderfully so uh, from watching this film every time I see it that this film seeks to entertain. It seeks to entertain its audience, and I think it does so in bursts of, say, this intense psychic powers conceit, which also provides the through line for a type of quasi-science um, uh, fiction or horror film genre element, which then relies upon bursts of energy and special effects scenes that punctuate the film. That's one way it entertains. And the other way it entertains is through its action set pieces. And I mentioned that there are a lot of action set pieces that are then designed and structured in a way that feels very much Brian De Palma. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we get into the latter half of this discussion. And also uh, very much in keeping with Brian De Palma films, uh, where we have very emotionally resonant uh, relationships. Here we have so many different permutations, different uh, setups of relationships. Some seem to quote-unquote work. Some are quote-unquote on the rocks. Some seem to be on the verge of finding some kind of connection, but maybe there is some sense of plot mechanism that maybe prevents a connection from fully forming. Or maybe there are connections that occur, but the connections are more than meets the eye, etc. And then you throw into the mix the Brian De Palma handling of the psychic powers element, and my goodness, you are in for one heck of a ride indeed when watching The Fury. Um, So uh, my dear friends, uh, let us now, uh, uh, well, let me conclude this general discussion section by saying that uh, this is a really uh, exciting, dynamic, and entertaining work indeed. Um, Even if it's not a film that, say, would be your number one favorite Brian De Palma film. And I don't know if I would call it my number one absolute favorite Brian De Palma film of all time. 
But that doesn't mean that it is any less entertaining. I mean, on the contrary, this is so compelling. It's so unnerving. It has a way of getting under one's skin. It also has those Brian De Palma uh, uh, drives and, and energetic pulses that uh, punctuate, as well as giving us bravura uh, performances and also giving us a way in in terms of the heart and soul. And sometimes the heart and soul and the soulfulness uh, can be fulfilled in this romantic, lush, and, and emotional way. Other times it can uh, we can feel like it's broken and we are heartbroken. And that too is part of the Brian De Palma experience, the emotional and the resonant and indeed the very powerful, as well as uh, the special effects and the suspense and tension and action. And therefore, in that way, this film could be said to be a wonderful combination of those two elements and thus a wonderful example of the filmography of Brian De Palma, again, in the form of this work, which is The Fury. Now, before we get into a, a discussion of the specifics and plot, I should say that I have on the table here uh, the Japanese Blu-ray of The Fury, which is a very reliable, really excellent, uh, it's their HD remaster version according to uh, the materials found in it. It's really wonderful, robust, and great. It has, I think, some of the features, or the features in fact are, in my, uh, my estimation or my understanding, identical to other releases that we have. For instance, I have here the Arrow release, um, this is Region uh, B, Arrow release, uh, so this is also nice. I like to the option of having the um, having the uh, the uh, uh, the cover art. Uh, so I've taken the liberty of re of using the cover art of uh, uh, this poster art design. But if you look inside, excuse me here, you can see the optional cover art. Uh, possibilities there. So I really like the Arrow release as well, but it is Region B. Uh, so those are some options in terms of of uh, watching the Fury in terms of uh, home media viewing or physical media uh, releases of this film. But if you are able to watch this film, The Fury, my dear friends, and if you have not yet seen it, and if you are okay with, uh, with uh, this type of content in your cinematic viewings, and indeed also if you have seen other Brian De Palma films, say the suspense or thriller or action films or the horror films, that, and you've enjoyed those films by Brian De Palma, then I can most assuredly recommend this film to you. This is the work, which is again from 1978, which is Brian De Palma's The Fury. All right, my dear friends, so you're back, which means that we can now speak, you and I, about this really wonderful film, a great example from the filmography of the legendary Brian De Palma, that is this film, The Fury. So again, we're going to talk now about spoilers and plot specifics. And so once again, if you haven't seen the film yet, please, I strongly suggest uh, you can turn off this video and then watch the film in your own good time. And you can come back at any time because the video will hopefully still be up here. And you can let me know at that time your thoughts and comments about this uh, film, which is The Fury. Okay, so uh, you're still here, so let's get right into it. So The Fury, there's a lot going on here. Now, I mentioned at the outset about how uh, this is, of course, a film that I think as its premise, as its hook, as it were, we have the psychic powers element. And the psychic powers element is, of course, uh, provided by the characterizations of Gillian, which is the Amy Irving character, and Robin, which is the Andrew Stevens character. And we have a type of connection between the two. Some of it's directly relevant. Others perhaps are maybe nuanced or suggested. Uh, but in any event, we understand that uh, Robin, who is the son of the character of Peter, who is the Kirk Douglas character, uh, they have the relationship at the very start. They seem to be very close in terms of father and son. And also, we understand that there is a violent episode that rips them apart very early on, which seems to be at the hands of the very uh, conniving and uh, uh, villainous uh, Childress, and this is the character who is portrayed with, I think, a sense of of uh, evil glee by John Cassavetes. 
And so we understand, too, that uh, there is an element of maybe some kind of institution or authoritarian aspect, uh, connections with CIA or ex-CIA, uh, which will explain uh, Peter's or uh, Kirk Douglas' uh, character Peter's uh, very uh, almost, uh, he has a, a great uh, physical prowess and skill, and he knows how to use firearms, and he's trained. So he seems to be someone who has a type of professional training uh, when it comes to being able to handle himself and, and deal with maybe uh, covertly and uh, in disguise, as it were, and also trying to uh, stay ahead of uh, Childress and his forces as they're trying to apprehend him and also trying to uh, trying to, again, figure out what's going on in terms of the, the overall arc of the film, The Fury. So uh, we have thus the relationship. One of the key relationships is the father-son relationship between Peter and the Andrew Stevens Robin character. Now, we understand also that this relationship undergoes, I think, a lot of transformation. And also, arguably, it it, uh, dis- it is destroyed or it it crumbles or it otherwise is uh, broken. And we see that from the very uh, outset. We're not outset. We see that from the very ending uh, of this relationship because uh, as Peter has spent most of the film, in essence, trying to find his son, trying to rescue his son uh, from the hands of Childers, unfortunately for him, uh, Andrew Stevens Robin doesn't seem to be willing to forgive his father for reasons that seem to be very subjective to him and also at the point of rescue you know at the very climax of the 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 rooftop there uh, unfortunately uh, for Peter and I suppose for Robin as well Robin is unwilling to accept the the uh, the uh, gesture of rescue from his father to the point he tries to attack him with the scratching of the face and that uh, makes him uh, lose his grip and he falls to his death unfortunately which in turn destroys Peter as well because we understand that immediately after this he is so distraught so uh, so uh, saddened by this that he then uh, leaps from the rooftop and thus takes his own life in a very tragic end to this father-son relationship. So here is one example where the Fury uh, in the hands of Brian De Palma deals with the emotional and intimate relationship. The out the the outcome of this relationship, however, is that of tragedy and that of sadness and that of ultimate destruction thereof. We also see elements or efforts on the part of the storytellers to show us other emotional relationships that there are maybe attempts at trying to forge some kind of connection or unity, but maybe at the end those uh, attempts to forge a connection or unity are thwarted or otherwise the relationship is destroyed. So case in point, we have also uh, the relationship between Hester and Peter. So this is the Cary Snodgrass character and um, and um, uh, Kirk Douglas character. And so uh, we have their uh, attempts at maybe, um, well, not attempts, but they, they attempt to meet. Uh, she tries to assist him in a very uh, undercover sort of way so as not to uh, get attention or not to uh, be conspicuous. Uh, and so uh, there's also the love interest, and uh, they have a an emotional and physical and intimate relationship and it seems like they will be together or maybe there might be room or there might be the possibility of them being together and indeed there's a little bit of a a a moment between Amy Irving's character and Kirk Douglas's character as they're on the bus and uh, there's a revelation that maybe yes for uh, Peter uh, Hester could have been someone that uh, he could have married and settled down with and uh, been with for the rest of his life but as we know unfortunately here's another relationship that is destroyed over the course of the film uh, because due to circumstances that perhaps again external forces circumstances beyond their control perhaps Hester is unfortunately killed while trying to help uh, Gillian escape uh, and then go into the hands and 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 uh, uh, aid uh, and uh, connect with uh, Kirk Douglas's character. And so here is another example of an e- effort to forge a relationship, but the relationship unfortunately is crumbled or destroyed. There are other efforts like this. For instance, uh, Fiona Lewis's character and Andrew Stevens' character. There's a, a kind of attempt at trying to maybe use this relationship, uh, which also has a physical or sexual dimension, as well as playing on maybe the psychological uh, weaknesses of Andrew Stevens' Robin. 
However, the tables are turned by the end because, as we know, there is a very climactic and violent scene involving her character being, uh, uh, being sort of teleported up into the air in this white room. I mean, there's another thing too. Don't have white rooms in a Brian De Palma film about psychic powers because you know the white walls will soon turn red. And that is indeed what happens here because, of course, uh, the, re the relationship is not just thwarted but, in fact, dashed and destroyed and perhaps on purpose, or not perhaps, but definitely on purpose at the hands of Robin and his psychic powers and the, and the throbbing veins in his forehead, of course, because um, he kills uh he kills uh the Fiona Lewis character and so uh we have uh, uh Susan right so we have the uh an attempt at a type of maybe uh psychologically dominant or sexually based relationship uh maybe an attempt at threat of togetherness as well at least from Robin's point of view he wants to have time with her he wants to be away but also there is jealousy there are some um inadequacies that he feels that really become exponentially, uh, uh, almost um, exponentially um, uh, increased to the point of no return. And so here is a, a relationship that is destroyed, but perhaps destroyed because of the uh, psychological uh, inadequacies that he feels, as well as the manipulative nature of uh, Susan and her position, because after all, we understand that she is here to try to manipulate Robin for some nefarious purposes because she has an association with Childress. And so there is a type of, of uh, uh, duplicity on both sides. But at the end of the day, uh, this relationship, although there could be said to be the founding or the possibility of a type of connection, that connection is ultimately broken. Or the connection is broken in favor of a more violent and dangerous connection, shall we say, in terms of Robin's psychic abilities taking uh, advantage uh, very, very horrifically and very, uh, very unforgettably. Uh, Susan, as she is uh, held up in the air in that very shocking way in which she meets her demise and the, the turning of the body and again the spray of the blood. It, it's really quite uh, quite, uh, quite unsettling indeed. Uh, before I move on, I should say too that the, the film The Fury, I mean, when it talks about the or when it deals with this idea of the psychic powers, a lot of the times it's dealt with Sometimes we see Gillian being able to manipulate, say, the train with her powers, or maybe she's able to hear people's thoughts when we get the uh, uh, the little almost uh, cameo appearance of William Finley as uh, Dunwoody. And so uh, sometimes we get that uh, inkling or that glimpse of her powers in that regard. But primarily, one can say that the Fury shows off the, uh, the psychic powers of these uh, individuals. Uh, in terms of blood and bleeding and bloodletting and that type of, of, of flesh explosion. And so we have, for instance, this issue or this point, this very memorable and quite chilling and gross scene involving Robin and his way with uh, the Fiona Lewis character at the very end there, which leads to her very grisly demise and the blood on the white walls. There's also, of course, the Charles Durning character, the doctor, and when uh, she is uh, caught, she catches his hand in a moment of sudden flashback in terms of the Institute and what happened to Robin and perhaps some of the nefarious connections or nefarious, say, uh, uh, networking that uh, the uh, Charles Durning character, who seems to be outwardly quite a, a friendly person, perhaps he has some uh, underlying sinister motive or motives, or perhaps his connections uh, with uh, sort of the evil forces a la Childers are, are, uh, uh, are perhaps hidden but still there. But in any event, we see the grasp of, of Amy Irving's Gillian on the hand there, and to the point where he uh, has a wound on his hand. And of course, he, one of the things about the film with his character is that it apparently cannot stop bleeding. And so we've seen from Avi Ir Amy Irving's character's perspective how her power shows a type of bleeding or bloodletting on the part of her quote-unquote victims. And we see earlier on in the school and the bleeding of the nose and also with the Charles Durning character, the bleeding of the hand. And then, of course, also at the very end, the climax of the film involving the very spectacular climax of the film involving the kiss and the physical contact on Childress' eyes, uh, John Cassavetti's eyes. And, of course, we lead to what could be the most 
or at least definitely one of the most, if not the most spectacular ending to any Brian De Palma film, namely the, the not just, uh, we, I mean, we have another pristine, lovely room with plants and lovely wallpaper and, and uh, clean uh, blankets and lovely picturesque, it's almost like something out of like a Laura Ashley catalog of some sort. And you have uh, Childers there suddenly being thrust into this final death throes uh, at the hands, at the mercy of the psychic powers of, of Amy Irving, uh, just as she opens her eyes to control his uh, bodily, uh, to control his body to the point of utter obliteration and the ultimate explosion in this otherwise uh, very picturesque Laura Ashley type of room there. My point is that uh, we have so many examples of the psychic powers in this film uh, to show bleeding or bloodletting. It's not, of course, the only uh, way that this happens. We also have uh, Robin and his ability to control the the, uh, the indoor amusement park ride, causing the, the damage and destruction there because of his jealousy that he feels with regard to the Fiona Lewis character just moments earlier, of course, uh, and also causing the sparks and electricity, uh, the... the, the the lights to explode, etc. But uh, primarily we see it through bloodletting and bleeding. Now this is, I think, adding to a sense of the eerie and chilling of the film The Fury. I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, this really makes it quite unsettling indeed. And there are suddenly shocking moments, jump cuts, where we see victims of, say, uh, Amy Irving's Gillian and uh, suddenly uh, shocks or shots of, of people with blood over their faces or something similar happens with a flashback that she sees or that's shown, which ends up being, of course, linked to the climax of the film uh, and the like. And so uh, these, I think, shocking jump cuts combined with the, the notion of bleeding or blood, I think, give the film this sense of the chilling and the the very unsettling and unnerving. Uh, from my point of view, uh, these kinds of, of uh, examples of the psychic powers really make for some very, um, very uh, uh, gross out feelings indeed. And I think that's uh, done very effectively and done on purpose. And to give the Fury an edge when it comes to its memorability factor in the canon of Brian De Palma's filmography. Now, this also uh, brings me to a point too, which I think is a very reasonable interpretation to have, which is like it reminds us too that the a film prior to this in the canon is Carrie, uh, directed by Brian De Palma just a few years prior, uh, a couple years prior, and. In Carrie, again, I don't want to go into too much details about that great film. Uh, if you want to watch uh, or listen to it, a conversation, I can direct your attention to a previous conversation we had on this channel about that very film, Carrie. But uh, just uh, in very general terms, of course, Carrie, the film and the character, does also involve telekinesis or psychic powers. There's also this uh, idea of blood or bleeding. Uh, in many respects in that film as well. And so I think for those and other reasons, one can uh, have a reasonable interpretation at the very... I mean, I know there's no plot uh, uh, links directly between Carrie and The Fury, but there is a way to maybe regard these two films as maybe spiritually connected. Uh, there's a type of, of a spiritual uh, similarity uh, between the two films in the, these regards. And, and to a certain degree, I can go along with that uh, reading or rendering of The Fury in the context of, say, uh, Carrie or other films in the Brian De Palma catalog. However, uh, unlike, say, Carrie, I would say that The Fury has more of the of the uh, sort of action-adventure edge to it. I mean, there's some maybe uh, car chase scenes or some uh, scenes involving, uh, you know, f uh, foot chases, etc. Uh, 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 chase, you know, the Childress's... Uh, forces are trying to apprehend uh, Kirk Douglas and there's a chase uh, here and there or there's a, a chance at escape in terms of Hester and Gillian uh, from the Institute etc so there are I think more of these action adventure set sequences or set pieces in the Fury than there are arguably in Carrie um, also there's the idea of the what Childers is representing in terms of the the sinister government uh, shadow forces or CIA or whatever uh, that uh, seem to be wanting to exploit people like Robin, etc., uh, for purposes of of uh, some kind of, I don't know, dominance or control or technology or whatever the case may be. In any event, there is also this idea of surveillance and also this idea of pursuit by uh, forces or forces seemingly unknown, seemingly connected with, uh, say, government institutions and the like. And so that type of 
of say uh, uh, maybe uh, that type of uh, integration into the plot of this um, uh, this sort of government slash shadow organization slash authoritarian uh, group out to get the individuals, including Kirk Douglas, including uh, Amy Irving, etc., or Karis Nodgris, etc. This could be said to be a, a part of a type of grand or almost a quasi-political bent uh, or aspect of the Fury that arguably is not necessarily as present in a film like, say, Carrie. Uh, though we should say that this idea of Brian De Palma dealing in certain regards anyway with government, with, uh, say, quote-unquote, conspiracy theories, uh, with shadow organizations, does find its voice in other films in the Brian De Palma canon. I mean, we can see, for example, Greetings and Hi, Mom, I think is an example from the early period. Or we can see... I mean, Maybe later on in the canon when we talk about films like, say, I don't know, Casualties of War, for instance, or uh, and the like. And so uh, and we'll get to that film and others uh, uh, a little bit later in this video series discussion. But uh, the point is that I think there are connections that can be made uh, to the film that immediately precedes this, which is Carrie. But that there are also ways in which this film acts on its own, as well as connect with, connecting with other non-Carrie films uh, in the Brian De Palma canon. Uh, and also I should point out, too, that the idea of uh, what I mentioned uh, at the start, which is the way in which this film deals, I think, very, very tenderly with emotional relationships. That is something I always wanted to uh, emphasize which is Brian De Palma's films, they can be, and I think very um, uh, justifiably, are regarded for their suspense, their tension, their, uh, say, horror uh, genre elements, etc., and done so uh, spectacularly and so memorably as is the fashion with John, uh, with uh, Brian De Palma, etc. But uh, I was going to say John Cassavetes, but uh, yes, but John Cassavetes' role in, in The Fury being one example of this. But uh, I think also, uh, when we should always try to emphasize this too, Brian De Palma has such a great way with human relationships in his films. So great. And whenever there is a type of, say, death or there is a, a, a destruction, there is a real weight to that. I would say, let's take Hester as an example. There is a real weight uh, that is felt when she uh, is uh, unfortunately killed. And we not only get that from the reaction of the characters, but we also get that in the the way in which the film and that moment is stylized in the really memorable slow motion and the many vantage points and the the uh, the points of view, uh, and you know, in terms of the cars that are pursuing her, in terms of of, of uh, Amy Irving as she's running down, in terms of uh, Kirk Douglas from another direction, in terms of Hester, in terms of another character from the the, the park there who also has certain sinister motives uh, uh, himself, as we will see uh, very soon after, but. Uh, so we have within this the very, I think, very beautifully arranged Brian De Palma aesthetic of various points of view under various camera angles, which are then uh, super, super realized in the slow motion manner. But in, amongst this scene, we have the outcome being uh, death and destruction of a number of characters, perhaps most notably and most tragically that of Hester. So uh, that my point here is that with, in the hands of Brian De Palma, uh, amongst all the great uh, cinematic uh, stylizations, which are so wonderfully realized in films like The Fury, there's always, always, always the element of the human. There's always the element of the emotional. And when someone loses uh, their life, in a Brian De Palma story, you really feel it. You really, really feel it. You feel it with her. And also, I would say you feel it with uh, Kirk Douglas's uh, characterization as well. After all this work that uh, he went through to try to find Robin, and it ended up being essentially for nothing, for naught, because of what uh, Robin uh, felt in terms of the anger and hatred towards his father, whether it's justified or not. Again, uh, it is, again, about the psychological portraits of these characters. And so you can understand uh, and feel like like Peter's choice or Kirk Douglas' character's choice at the end is maybe not necessarily so much plot-driven, because everything was about the plot mechanics up to that point, but his final choice is purely emotional and purely psychological. And that is, again, another great indication of how Brian De Palma's works deal, too, with the emotional depth, the psychological depth, and how many times those choices run or, or run um, uh, very much uh, 
uh, primary. Uh, to the concerns of Brian De Palma cinema at that given moment. And The Fury, I think, is a great example of this uh, in many regards, in many, many regards. So I think maybe to wrap up this conversation, I think we can also say that uh, we mentioned the stylistic uh, underpinnings of this uh, really great work, The Fury. And this is also revealed, as I mentioned, in a lot of the camera work. We mentioned the slow motion sequence, which is one of the essential sequences of the film. We also can see a lot of the uh, depth of the uh, of the field and a lot of the ways in which uh, lens work is used to show things in the foreground and in the background, also to show a sense of a split uh, as well, which also is very much reflective of a type of split in certain personalities, shall we say, certain quirks. Uh, I think Robin being a great example of this in terms of the way he seems and appears at the start of the film versus how he appears at the end of the film. Well, there seems to be a huge split in terms of, of those uh, various appearances of this same character. And we also see, to the the way that the camera moves. Uh, it goes from left, you know, it pans or goes from side to side and side to side again when we have uh, dialogue uh, conversations, uh, you know, uh, maybe early on, uh, 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 Peter and Robin or, or Peter and Childress, etc. So we have the way in which the camera seems to hover and move almost imperceptibly at, one mo- at some moments, but in other moments when it's very handheld and very frantic and very frenzied, again, at the start or just before, uh, just as Hester's trying to urge uh, Gillian on, um, Amy Irving's character, on to escape. And she is almost in this, uh, not, not, uh, 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 she's not motivated enough to move. And there's a tension in the air, and the camera is, is uh, following her in the mail and dropping the man, trying to create di- diversions, etc. So there's a way in which the camera has this uh, almost float. Uh, it floats in the air one moment, and then, some moments and in other moments it's very handheld and frenzied which also adds to the tension and suspense of the scene so that's again uh, great camera work as well and then to the uh, the special effects sequences as they're portrayed uh, there are a lot of special effects sequences here involving say uh, uh, amusement rides that crash through buildings or uh, the bleeding elements or uh, sudden nosebleeds etc or uh, ways in which uh, the cuts and the music add to the eeriness of these effects and sudden uh, jump cuts or flash frames that suddenly show different spaces and times altogether, all of a sudden in this sort of jump scare type of of, uh, of modality. And then uh, we have uh, uh, the the as I mentioned to the the bleeding and the explosions. Uh, I should say I've said it before. I'll say it again. Uh, the explosion of Childress, the the uh, body explosion of John Cassavetes that closes out the film is one of the most spectacular endings of any film. It's one of the most spectacular endings in a Brian De Palma film, and it's one of the most spectacular endings in any film. My goodness. Uh, you see the head fly through the air, and you see the, you know, not once, twice, but like many times, and then slow motion as well, uh, and and the like. So uh, it is, uh, this is a spectacle of special effects, and it's done so well, and it's almost like, it's it, for many people. It's it's like the highlight of the film. It's the most spectacular special effects sequence in the film, and they saved the in the, in the manner of speaking. They saved the best for last in a manner of speaking. So, uh, in that way too, this is a special effects extravaganza. Uh, but we also have the layering of various elements. Uh, I mentioned the camera work uh, by uh, uh, Richard Klein, and then also. Um, Richard H. Klein and also the music by John Williams, I should mention here, there is a, a type of, of, of pulse or a um, almost hi- a hypnotic quality to the music that suddenly has this quiet uh, foreboding that's, that turns imperceptibly and then suddenly, uh, but then suddenly, uh, imp- imperceptibly then suddenly into this grandiose uh, operatic feel. And that's, I think, a great touch because it reminds us that this too, uh, the Fury, is very much like an opera. It very much has the heights and depths of of human emotion. And those uh, heights and depths of human emotion are expressed in these huge, huge terms. Uh, And so, uh, and I think uh, we we not only are reminded of this in the handling of Brian De Palma's uh, great camera work and and the cinematography of Klein and also uh, the, the way the story is assembled. 
and the many characters, but also the music as well. So the music gives us the sense of the operatic, the sweep, uh, while also giving us at the same time those quiet moments along the way. I mentioned that lovely moment uh, in the bus ride between Amy Irving and Kirk Douglas when he essentially breaks down uh, and um, uh, really re- shows his vulnerability at a moment just after the sudden shock of the death of Hester. And also I should mention too, there's a lovely moment early on where uh, Kirk Douglas goes into the apartment of uh, uh, this couple and the, the, the old lady, the mother figure, and the couple is very much uh, hesitant to try to help, but the mother becomes so so attached to uh, uh, Kirk Douglas. So there's this lovely rapport between them as he's trying to, to escape from Childress down in the street below and trying to uh, put on a uh, disguise, etc. But that lovely rapport between the two of them you know, this this uh, elderly woman and Kirk Douglas character it's so great that's such a lovely character moment also too when he's uh, trying to uh, essentially escape with the police car and talking to you know Dennis Franz and makes an appearance there it's a really great appearance in, in, t- in that uh, brief discussion between them these character moments are really quite uh, quite brilliant indeed and I should say too that the the back and forth the vi- the uh, the the utter almost a clash of the titans like aspect of this of uh, of the moments that Kirk Douglas and John Cassavetes are together and it's really like titans clashing it's it's fantastic this leads me to uh, the performances. Uh, I mentioned Kirk Douglas, who has this great physicality, and he's really just giving it his all, and it's wonderful in terms of his physical performance, as well as the emotional depths that he is willing to explore, not only in his relationship with Hester, but also in his relationship with with uh, uh, Gillian, Amy Irving's character, and also Robin, of course, the key, key fundamental relationship that drives him from beginning, middle, and ultimately to his eventual and very sad and tragic end. There's Kirk Douglas. I mentioned Amy Irving, who has this sense of not being able to understand or being able to appreciate or control what it is she has, and she's almost scared of it. She's scared to hurt people around her, uh, which is uh, uh, this sense of vulnerability that Amy Irving shows so well and so effectively. But then at the very end, the very last moment, she's able to take advantage of her powers and use it in a way uh, as a type of uh, final uh, coup de grace, the final act of revenge against uh, for everything that's happened to her and the people around her that she's loved. Other performances come to my Terry Snodgrass as Hester. She has this uh, sense of almost a world weariness about her on the one hand, but also a, a kind of down-to-earth feeling on the other. I love her performance so much and her character so much because she is very much... Uh, she, you know, she doesn't have any special powers, right? She's not uh, someone uh, gifted with psychic abilities, at least to the ex- degree that um, that Amy Irving's character is or uh, Andrew Stevens' character is. I mean, I think she does display a little bit of, of uh, uh, ESP sensitivity at the very start, but not not uh, not to the degree that uh, she will be, uh, you know, on the level of, of uh, say, uh, Robin, for example. But she has a a a sense of uh, of uh, down to earthness. Uh, and the sense of also the earnestness and wanting to help and wanting to save the day. And I really love that because with all the almost the otherworldly things that are happening in the film and all the sort of uh, uh, the, the, the dastardly, almost Titan-esque like aspect of Childress or Peter or the superpowers of, of say, Andrew Stevens and Amy Irving, etc. It's nice to have another uh, counterbalance of a character like Hester who can be said to be very much the every person. Uh, and, and in any way, in that way, maybe our conduit, our being the viewers, our conduit into this world through her eyes, through her experiences. And so, um, uh, and then other performances, Andrew Stevens and Fiona, uh, Fiona Lewis, uh, they have a, a kind of, um, they have a kind of a really twisted relationship that I alluded to earlier. I think they provide this, uh, that type of, of outwardly discomfort uh, but done in a way that is, I think, very tastefully presented on screen. Uh, but always that undercurrent of the disturbing and chilling and unnerving is always present, especially in their scenes because of what it is the relationship implies. Now, the both of the the actors pulled this off so tremendously well. Uh, it's really wonderful. And I love Andrew Stevens, that growing sense of paranoia that he feels at just and that uncontrollable rage that just grows and grows and grows to the point of being... Uh, just uh, monstrous, absolutely monstrous. That's a great performance. Uh, and then, uh, oh, of course, uh, last but certainly not least, John Cassavetes. John Cassavetes, one of the great 
villain performances of the age. When you talk about uh, uh, when we talk about uh, Brian De Palma's film canon, uh, a lot of times we have to talk about the villains and the and the uh, the antagonists of his films. And there's so many great, memorable antagonists in all of Brian De Palma's uh, canon. But I think uh, Childress, uh, John Cassavetti's Childress, has to be up there as being one of the great, great villains in a Brian De Palma film. This is uh, s- spectacular. He is evil. He is he is uh, uh, he is. Uh, Dastardly, he uh, will stop at nothing to achieve his goals. He will manipulate. He will uh, be vicious, and he will lie and cheat. Uh, and uh, when he gets his comeuppance, my goodness, my goodness! I don't know whether I should cheer or whether I should just be my jaw dropped in shock and awe. I'm not sure, but in any event, so villainous and therefore so so memorable. It matches all of the titanic aspects of the of the film. It's almost like, um, uh, you know, the Twilight of the Gods or, or that type of uh, huge proportionality that he brings, the heft that he brings to the to the film and to the proceedings. Oh my goodness! John Cassavetes in a Brian De Palma film, fantastic. So these and other performances are really what make uh, or provide provide a lot of the the strength of the film and also the other elements of the film that I mentioned earlier. Now, I should say, too, that, again, at the end of the day, um, it might not necessarily be my favorite Brian De Palma film. I, I think um, while there are a lot of elements that uh, really blend together very well, there's also a sense of, in an interesting way, when it talks about the slow motion and maybe the, the split diopter uh, effects or aspects of it, one can say that while those elements are in the film The Fury, maybe there are other examples in the Brian De Palma canon that go even further, if you know what I mean. So, so in that way, I think sometimes it might get lost in the conversation in terms of what are the great Brian De Palma films. And indeed, from my vantage point as well, whenever I think of my favorite Brian De Palma films, maybe other films might come to my head uh, before talking about The Fury. So, uh, But that doesn't mean that for me The Fury is in any way a weak Brian De Palma film. On the contrary, I think it is very, very strong for the reasons that I've tried to state here. And I think uh, it is grand, grand entertainment, operatic entertainment, a lot of bleeding, a lot of, of, uh, of really uh, disturbing uh, qualities to the film that add to its overall effectiveness and entertainment value, as well as being packed with many elements, action adventure, suspense, horror, uh, the human emotional drama, etc., that really make for a great example of what, uh, uh, why the films of Brian De Palma are as great as they are. Here's another great example of this, my dear friends. This is the film which is The Fury. All right, my dear friends, so let us end the conversation here. I hope that's okay with you, and maybe we can continue this uh, at the next video or the next video in this discussion series. But uh, until then, my dear friends, uh, please let me know what you think about the film in the comment section below. I always love to hear what it is you have to say. Uh, But until the next video, my dear friends, please be happy and healthy and well, and please keep on watching a lot of great, great, great movies, including Brian De Palma movies such as The Fury. But until the next video, my dear friends, stay strong, stay safe, and cheers.